years. Fifteen years ago, he and my aunt were invited to go back to Berlin because they invited all the Jewish artists that they'd lost because of the war, those that were still alive, to come back. And my uncle, who was a phenomenal artist, hmm. painted a portrait of the uh, then president of uh, Germany, mm -hmm. who was, happened to sit across the table from him at the time. And he <laughs> asked him, would he mind if he painted his pa portrait? The German says, not at all. <laughs> so my uncle took his picture, he came back home to the States, and he painted a portrait of him. It's oh. now hanging, supposedly, by what I understand, in Berlin, in what we would call our White House, which is the Reichstag. So it hangs there it now? It hangs there, by what I understand. How about that? I have the letter where they thanked him for the uh, portrait. And so anyways, he was an artist, and uh, my father was just a businessman. Mm -hmm. And what about your family? Uh, you had sisters and I brothers? I had, had an older brother and an older sister okay. at the time. And uh, my grandfather was a wine merchant. He had his own wine store. And on my mother's side now, my mother's side of the family was not Jewish. Hmm. They were Lutheran, so mm -hmm. therefore they were only, they would only be affected if it ever got out that their darling daughter married a Jewish boy. Oh, yeah. So, you know, so this was kind of kept undercover, but my grandfather was a shoemaker on my mother's side. Hmm. And, uh, of course, grandmother stayed at home in those days. They were just nice, chubby old ladies. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the normal yeah, that thing was the in those norm, days. Right. Sure. Right. And so you went to uh, elementary school? And no, I did not go to school in Germany because I was in the hospital when I should have been going oh, to school. Oh, I see. So I, didn't, I never went to school there, but uh, my brother and sister, one day, uh, they didn't come home from school. They'd been pulled out of school and sent to a, quote and unquote, school for Jewish children. Hmm. And uh, my parents had to figure out where they took the kids to. I had no idea. There was no warning on this, nothing. And uh, about, like I say, after Kristallnacht, my parents' mind was made up. We were leaving one way or another. My father proceeded to uh, do a little bit of artistic work on some documents himself. <laughs> and of course, with my uncle's help, they managed to get some pretty good looking papers and to hit the road, so to speak. But again, staying a little bit uh, to be not noticed was almost impossible. They hauled me out of this hospital with a cast on. Uh, how do you have a six-year-old child or seven-year-old child with a cast and not be noticed, you know? So Good heavens. My uh, parents... You didn't have an iron lung, huh? That was before the days of the iron lung, but they that had something similar. The they had me in a tube of some kind with all kinds of lights on, and then every morning they rolled me out into a solarium. So I don't know what the object of all of that was. I was a bit So they foot. packed you out of the hospital? Uh-huh. And my goodness, so, with your parents? Well, my uh, parents were the ones that pulled me out of the hospital, oh, and see. we left the next morning. And my father or mother or somebody rigged up this uh, stroller so that, because I was from here on down in a cast, so I was stiff as a board. And uh, they rigged up the stroller because the cast was gypsum. It wasn't like now where everything is plastic, it's light. That gypsum cast probably weighed as much as I did. <laughs> And for people to go on the run with that is pretty difficult, so they had me in the stroller. And I remember at one point, we were crossing a street somewhere, and there was a little girl with her mother, and there was my mother pushing the stroller, and my sister and my brother, and this little girl said to her mother, she sure is lazy. Look at them, they gotta push her around. My sister was gonna <laughs> duke her. She was gonna just let her have it, and my mother took she it. She had no idea. She had, well, not only that, but my mother didn't want any confrontation with anybody. No. You know, that was dangerous for us. Our papers were forged. They were oh. fake. So, uh, and you know, you're supposed to have worn that uh, Star of David yeah, and all that, right, and right. none of this was visible, you know, any of that. So. Right. And we didn't want any confrontation, so my mother just took my sister right by the arm, and she says, you come over here and you stay over there. Mm -hmm. And she says, I don't want to hear a word out of you. <laughs> so <laughs> that was about the only confrontation I can recall. I but we did, did you witness any 
any violence in the city yourself, uh, coming or going? Or no, our parents kept us pretty much under Pretty much that. Uh, yeah, protected. We were very protected. Away from that, that. Yes. yes, yes. And I remember my grandmother the last, well, right after I got from the hospital, we went to my grandparents' house. And I remember my grandmother taking my hand, and she's putting something in it, and she says, now when it's safe for you to wear this, I'd like for you to wear it, but ask your mom and dad first if it's safe. It was an old silver chain with a tiny, tiny Star of David on mm -hmm. it. And she gave my sister one also. Wow. Well, since we were walking most of the way out of Germany, I don't know what transportation took place, I don't recall, between the edge of Berlin. But you were still suffering the effects of oh, yeah. polio. Yeah. And they walk you out of Well, they carried me out, yeah. literally, out the back door. I see. And they had me in that stroller. And well, my mother took the two necklaces, and on the back of the stroller was a pocket. <coughs> and she slipped those two necklaces clear down in the bottom of that pocket. So when we finally wound up at uh, St. Bernard's Path, up there at the junction of Italy, Switzerland, and Germany. Right. For some reason, there was a reason why we had to take a certain train. Hmm. Exactly why, I don't know, but it was imminent that we were there on time, and you know, it was, it was a very, uh, you could feel the pressure of having to catch this particular train. Oh, I'm sure. So when this train pulled in, uh, my uncle went on one side in the train, my father on the outside, and they were just throwing kids in, you know. There were three of us kids, my brother, my sister, and me. And as the train pulls out, my mother sees that stroller sitting on the platform. So that stroller ne never went with us. Oh, and of course, at six and a half, almost seven years old, I boohooed all the way to China about that necklace <laughs> I wasn't going to get to wear. <laughs> and I'm sure my parents had a lot more problems than that oh, necklace. My so this story picks up again a little later, that necklace story. Well, uh, now this, this uh, which fascinates me and, and will fascinate anyone who hears your story, uh, that trip across, across half of the world was, must have been very, very uh, uh, trying. For my parents, most very difficult. yes. And it was by train. Well, we, did, we went from um, the St. Bernard's Path down to Rome by mm -hmm. train. I remember that train ride. And I remember going on another train from Rome to Naples. And I know when we, were, we got onto the <coughs> Terokuni Maru, which was a Japanese luxury ship that uh, went around the Horn all the way around mm -hmm. up to China through the Suez Canal. Suez Canal? Yeah, I think so. Through the Suez Canal? Yeah. And uh, as we pulled away from Naples, we saw the Vesuvius in the background. As a matter of fact, I have a picture of wow. it. And you can see the uh, lava trickling down the side uh -huh. of the mountain. My father trying to explain the whole history of the Vesuvius and, <laughs> and Pompeii and Herculaneum. And sure. Because, you know, we were kids and we were all, this was all stuff we hadn't learned in school yet. My brother maybe had, because he was six years older than me, so he was pushing 13. You were the youngest, were you? I was the youngest of the three of us. Hmm. And, uh, I remember seeing that lava trickling down the side of the mountain. Oh my goodness. The, the trip from there uh, up until we hit India, uh, Bombay. In Bombay, the ship pulled in for more passengers or whatever, and then they pulled out a couple of days later, and then all of a sudden the ship made a U-turn and went back, and of course my parents Right away, what do you think? You're traveling on fake papers, right? Mm -hmm. So my parents were pretty edgy. I remember that. Mm. And then what had actually happened is they left half the cargo on the pier. They just went back for cargo, nothing's more serious. But we also knew that uh, Hitler had already moved towards uh, India, what? trying to get all right. of that into line also. So they oh. were very concerned at that time. Well, yeah, because then, <coughs> Then the, uh, the alliance uh, between Germany and Japan. Well, that didn't come about until 30, until 42, 42, after Pearl Harbor. After Pearl Harbor. Right. And that's when Hirohito and uh, Adolf Hitler became 
buddy bosom, buddy bosom buddies. I'll get it straight. Yeah, right. And then, bosom uh, buddies. <laughs> well, you know, uh, taking a trip like that at that young age, in, <clears throat> when you're so impressionable, yeah, you we must were. have a very vivid memory of so much of it. I think that's probably the only reason I would remember so much of it is because it was very impressing. Like we stopped at uh, Madagascar, oh. the island of Madagascar, and I remember my father and another gentleman traveler were talking, and one of them says it's so hot you can fry eggs on the pavement. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon you see these two gentlemen, suit and all, get down off the uh, boat and frying eggs on the pavement. <laughs> now I remember that my mother was besides herself. Like I said, my father was an overgrown kid, you know. <laughs> so, but it was hard enough to actually fry eggs on the pavement. Well, you, uh, you know, that's fascinating to me because uh, I love geography and, uh, and I can just visualize. Well, then you must have, <coughs> you, you you, you okay, went past the canal. you went past Sicily and then did right. you come through the Suez Canal? Yes, we came through the canal. Then straight south to yeah, Madagascar. Straight south and before then we came you around. Across yeah, until the we Indian zagged Ocean. around to the India oh, area. Oh, I see. I see. And sure. uh, the trip itself was phenomenal. It was a luxury liner, mm -hmm. and I've got some pictures. It was really very nice. Uh, they removed my cast while we were on board of the ship because my older brother had a mischievous side to him and he told me the story that if lightning strikes and the ship goes down, I'd never come up with that cast on. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I kind of right raised down. the rocus until the ship's doctor removed the cast. <laughs> 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 so I have a picture of my mother and me walking away from the camera. They had a pool on the ship on board and we're walking towards the pool. My uncle took the picture and you could actually see the deformity at the time. Really? Yeah, you could mm -hmm. see it more so than, yeah. I've got a deformed hip out of it, but nothing serious. Well now, uh, your fellow passengers on that ship, were they a mixture of people yes. or, or were they mostly They were a mixture refugees. of people. I have the uh, uh, passenger list book Mm -hmm. From the Terracotta. Oh, you do? Oh, yes, my oh, mother was wow. in my mother's things when she passed away, and my word. I got a picture of the group that traveled with us on that ship. Right. And uh, they were uh. all kinds. And they were Orientals. Mm -hmm. There were several Jewish people on mm -hmm. board with us mm -hmm. that came out of Germany. How they got to Italy, I have no idea no either. No idea. But well, from what I've read, of course, um, even, even among yourselves, you didn't speak a lot about what you were doing or no. where you came from, even correct. with fellow refugees, right. because you never knew. Well, the less you told about yourself, the better the chances yes. of survival. Exactly. So. And you never knew if there was somebody in the crowd who would turn right. you in or whatever. Isn't that something? What a way of life, my goodness. Well, this, this, this is a legend. This is a marvelous, know. marvelous story. So you were in uh, the, then uh, Bombay for just a couple just of days. Just a couple days, of huh? days at most. It was a short time. And, and then by out, ship again? To the same ship just kept going right around. Right into around the, India. Uh, yeah, right around India. And then they turned around and went back to uh, Bombay, and of course my parents were a little shook up over that, oh, not I'll knowing bet. why. They didn't give a reason why they turned back. Right. And uh, anyways, they just went back for some cargo they'd left behind. <laughs> 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 Whew, when we hit Hong Kong, we hit Ceylon first, I think. Yeah, I remember Ceylon. Oh, yeah. Somebody got off the ship in Ceylon. And uh, from there we went on to Hong Kong, and then from Hong hmm. Kong to Shanghai. Now, arriving in Shanghai was a definite uh, culture shock. Well, I can imagine. The Sino-Japanese War was still running hot. Uh, I see my mother still standing, at getting off the plank, the gangplank there, saying to my father, what have we gotten ourselves into? Yeah, see, by this time, of course, you, let me interject, 
<coughs> for history's sake, that by this time, uh, the Japanese had already raped Nanking oh, yeah. and uh, done all those terrible, they, yeah. terrible things. They were already in Shanghai. Uh, they uh, totally, actually, they tried as much as they could to keep the battles out of the cities. Yeah. But they were still killing each other over there. Oh, it's terrible. And, uh, terrible. Military all over the place. And of course, at that time, my parents had no idea how bad is Germany going? You know, we, mm -hmm. there was no contact. It isn't like now where you can pick up a phone and say, hey, how's it going in Germany, you know? Mm -hmm. You couldn't no. do that. <laughs> so uh, as a result, they had no idea what was going on in Germany. And uh, so as a result, my mother must have wondered, uh, what have we done? Have we done the right move, oh. you know? I have a postcard that my Sorry. father had sent my father, sister, my aunt and uncle in 1940, 42. It was just before. He sent the postcard just before Pearl Harbor. Okay. Just days before, by mm -hmm. what's written on the postcard. The postmark stamp just tells you that it's the year and it didn't tell you what exact date it was, but it had to be just before because I had another sister and my mother gave birth to a child mm. in 1942. And uh, on that postcard, it says, in essence, he sent it to New Jersey, okay? And uh, my uncle and aunt, my father's sister and her husband and their son, made it to Portugal. And my uncle was a professor at the Berlin University. And uh, I don't know if he was a full professor or just a, you know, mm -hmm. interim I professor. Don't I don't know something. those things. But anyways, he had some friends in Canada, and they got him, got them a visa into the States, and into Canada, and then ultimately they came to the States. But the postcard was addressed to a relief organization in New York. Oh, yes. And they found my uncle and aunt, who at that some later date, I don't know when exactly they got this postcard, may have been a year before they mm -hmm. got it, found them in New Jersey. And I found this postcard when I helped my 95-year-old aunt move from New Jersey to Maryland. And I'd ask my uh, husband and my brother, my uncle, being a professor, he had books everywhere. He had documents everywhere. And the basement was full of filing cabinets. As mm -hmm. please go down there, make sure we're not getting rid of something we shouldn't be. So my brother comes up with this postcard. It was written on one side by my father and the other side by my uncle that was in China with us and came out of Shanghai. And uh, both of them, in essence, were saying, we don't think we're going to survive this. Wow. So uh, that was evidently the last communication that I could find any sign of up until after the war. Mm -hmm. and what a gem of a, of a treasure to have yeah, that postcard. I have that, and I have another one a little <laughs> later in the story. Uh, Anyways, uh, they immediately, when we got off the ship, they had uh, those big trucks, flatbed type trucks. They loaded us on those. Now, mind you, we just got off of a luxury liner. This is Shanghai. That's Shanghai. And we're being loaded onto a flatbed, <laughs> you know? So. <laughs> That's a rude awakening. It is. When I think, for children, it makes a little difference. Hey, we got to ride on a big truck that we never rode on before, right? Right. <laughs> so, uh, it made a little difference, <laughs> but to my parents it had have been horrendous. Oh. And they took us to a centralized Jewish area in, Ch in Hong Kong, which is a bedroom community of Shanghai. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where we, they put us up in some type, type of shelter up until my parents could find lodging, which in China is very hard to find because they're so overpopulated with their own people, plus thousands of others coming oh, yes. in, you know, so. Uh, anyways, my parents found a, found a place and uh, they bought a house. And it was all right from 39 to 42. And that's when Pearl Harbor hit. Right, right. And then, the Jap then Hitler ordered the Japanese to annihilate the Jewish community and the Japanese who had a soft spot in their heart for the Jewish community because of the 
turn of the last century, the 1890 to 19 something, Japan was in a terrible financial depression and people were dying, they were starving to death and no country in the world would loan them the money to pull them out of it until a Jewish banker in New York let loose with some money. Really? Yes. I didn't know that. And that uh, once he let go of the money, well then the other banks followed suit. And of course, you know, and the, the, the Japanese had the Russo-Japanese war to fight in they, That's what 19, put them in there, that, uh, sure. uh, that Sino-Japanese war yeah. and the uh, Russo one. Right. Uh, that's put them into this depression, but uh, the Japanese, being very honorable people, never forgot that. And they hmm. said, we don't have a problem with these people being here. And Hitler no. demanded that they put us out. So they finally came to an agreement because they had a large Jewish community, like the, the Kaduris, the uh, uh, Sassoons. These are all big Jewish families that oh, have been yes. there since 1600s. You yes. know, big families with big names with big contribution <coughs> to the uh, economy over there. So uh, uh, they came to an agreement. Anybody that arrived after 1937 was to go in the camps. Well, was what? Was to go in the camps. Going to Voila, camp. Here I was. From there the you were. From the frying pan into the fire, or from the fire to the frying pan, whichever. Right. Thing. There we were for the entire Second World War. Hmm. So when I was, uh, let's see, how old was, was that? Was that a very uh, compact, uh, cramped well, community? In a room about half the size of this room, if it were square. That's we what had you had to live in. 18 families. Wow. 18 families. 18 families. And My goodness sakes. Well, the bunks were stacked high, yeah, and makeshift curtains between each little family. So now, by this time, you were how old? Let's see. That was in '42. We went in, so I was ten years old by then. Ten years old. But uh, when I first got to China, my parents immediately enrolled us into an English school, which was a, Kadu a Jewish English school, which was Kaduri school. And the Japanese agreed to allow the Kaduris to operate the schools. Mm -hmm. Even during all of that, they never stopped. They wanted us educated because most of us were not only bilingual, but multilingual. And they were counting on winning this war. They weren't counting on getting flattened, you know. No. <laughs> they didn't count on our GIs. <laughs> Did you learn Chinese and Japanese? And I did at the time, but I found out here five years ago that my Chinese is no longer the Chinese they speak over there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hard to keep up, uh, you know. Well, I never used it again. First of all, use. I lost a lot of it, yes, sure. from not using it. But then what I did remember, they speak a whole different Chinese now because China had 15 million little dialects. Nobody could understand each other once mm. you left your little town. Oh, well, no. Mandarin. So the and, yeah. Oh. The communists came in and said, one Chinese language. We're all Chinese, one Chinese language. And I got to give them credit for that. <laughs> Even though I, I could understand part of it, but talking to them was a different scenario. Right, right. But uh, the now, Japanese. How about your health at this time? Well, I stayed out of the cast. I developed normally after that. Wonderful. Pretty much normally. My right leg is a bit shorter than the left. Mm -hmm. And a hip is deformed, but uh, hey, clothing covers a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, you um, are, you are a survivor um, in so many ways. I don't know. I had parents that were very positive people, and I was surprised to find that postcard of my father not being positive. It's the only time I'd ever known him not Isn't to be positive. Isn't that something? Yeah. yeah. It must have been very depressing on on, them, on the yes. older people. Yes, you yeah. know, they were educated people. Uh, earning a living in China was impossible for a Caucasian at the time because uh, they have this saving face thing at the time going on. I don't think it's anymore, but uh, a white person couldn't go to work for a Chinaman. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, earning a living over there is literally impossible. You had to start your own business. And of course, when the Japanese came in, well, they claimed the house, they claimed the business, 
and put us all into Hong Kao or into mm. where I was at. I was in Wayside, they call Wayside Camp. Mm. And basically, for me as a child, in between the bombings and uh, raids and all this stuff, I think children adapt. They adapt to their surroundings. Yes. You know. Uh, well, that's that's one, you know, one great thing about youth, yeah. and that is you You're can, <laughs> and you can, you live through it and yes. survive. So. Well, now you talk about the bombing and so forth. Um, this was the Japanese bombing. No, this was the Allies. They oh, this come was over the to Tokyo. Okay, oh, they yeah. go over Tokyo, and if Tokyo was fogged in, they swung around and hit Shanghai. Right. So this was their usual, or whatever they had <coughs> left on board, they'd swing around and hit Shanghai. But hmm. uh, they knew that they had the camps there, and they had good ideas where they were at, but the Japanese are also intelligent people, you've got to give them some credit. They put all of their ammo dumps right around us. So if we hit their ammo dumps, they'd take the camp out. Hmm. And uh, so they were pretty well safe with their ammo, they had ammo. But uh, when the war was finally over, uh, I think the Allies expected a battle in uh, Shanghai Harbor, which they didn't get. The Japanese just handed them the key to the harbor and said, they're all yours, and turned around and walked away, because they knew the war was over. Yeah. After uh, well, we'd, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. We'd, uh, we'd pretty well taken care of, yeah. of the Japanese Navy, and then as you point right. out, the the dropping of the bombs. So they knew it was over and there was no sense in killing more people, so they just settled it peacefully. They just said, here, it's all yours. Now, now here, so yes. here the war's over, and are you high and dry? I mean, nowhere well, to go? You well, know, that's the worst part of a war. First of all, Shanghai was literally flat. You know, it, everything was bombed out. If it wasn't bombed out by the Allies, it was bombed out by the Japanese in the fight for Shanghai. Right. Originally, and they had, didn't have time to rebuild anything. No. So here we are in these camps and no place to go to. <sighs> now the Allies brought in food and clothing. And uh, let's face it, uh, kids grow regardless of how poor, poorly they're fed. I know. So uh, they may not be as fat as other kids, but they do do some growing. And so as a result, like the sleeves were up here, you know. <laughs> so they uh, sent in uh, the US, I think they were from the USO, a couple, they, what was their name? Had a ski on the end. Anyways, they came in, they opened up a youth center for us and uh, they uh, made uh, exchanged with California kids or all over the country here. Mm -hmm. Kids from schools would write letters and we'd correspond with them. And they opened up a regular good youth center and they also brought in crates of clothing, mm. particularly shoes. None of us had any shoes. We were running around barefooted or in wooden clogs. And uh, I thought I died and went to heaven when I got my first pair of shoes back. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, the clothing was just, these people were phenomenal in organizing that, and as quickly as they did. They that was in, a uh, remarkable yeah, operation. K rations and C rations yeah. by the cases, and then of course, you know, the medical people were there, and they said, now listen, here's all this food, but you can't eat it, <laughs> because uh, they said it would destroy our livers because we were so malnourished at that point and we had to you know, eat just little at a time. Mm. But as a whole, uh, within a year's time, you know, things picked up and uh, my father got a job with uh, uh, the BX. My father knew how to drive a truck, which at the time not everybody did because not everybody had a car. Right. And so he also got my uncle a job with the motor pool over there. Mm -hmm. And my uncle was given the pleasure of escorting the Nazis that they rounded up in Shanghai to the pier. And the night before, my father took my uncle out and he showed him all the roads that had the biggest potholes. 
<laughs> and he says, now tomorrow morning you take this road. And uh, they had all these Nazis in the back in shackles, you know. You know how the, the military trucks are, bench yes. here, bench here. And they took them across the biggest potholes there were. <laughs> On the side of these big trucks, they had a spare battery for them. My uncle hit these potholes so hard he lost the battery someplace. <laughs> <laughs> and these people in the back didn't know that my uncle wasn't an American. They assumed he was an American. They didn't know he understood every word they were saying, and they were just cursing up a blue streak. Oh, and my everything. uncle was just driving and smiling. <laughs> <laughs> that was my uncle's most favorite story. He says, I brought him great pleasure to do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the ultimate of getting even. <laughs> really getting even. They, he drove them to the harbor, and they unloaded them and sent them back to Germany. So wonder the truck didn't break down. It's a miracle, well, because those trucks were made at the time yeah. for this, you know. Right. They were military trucks, they had to go over any kind of ter mm -hmm. terrain. Mm -hmm. But then uh, my father finally met his end uh, in 48, so three years after the war. And my mother had another child, a younger brother. He's a teacher in Wyoming. And. Uh, he says, he tells everybody I'm his younger sister. He doesn't dare tell him I'm the older one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's 14 years younger than I am. 14? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> so then along comes communism. Here's my mother, a widow with two teenage girls and a baby. No visible means of support, no way out. And we were on a quota to come to the States, but those quota numbers were endless. Mm -hmm. Day after day, you're sitting in the consulate. They so were very strict about that, Yes, they, they were very. Yeah. And that kind of is what uh, yeah. irritates me a little bit about now the immigration problems we're having. Right. My mother even had to sign a piece of paper saying that we uh, would never be, if we ever get picked up for anything illegal, whether it's uh, whatever it is, including particularly prostitution, they would deport us. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I don't know where they would have deported us where to. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because we came into this country as stateless. We were stateless refugees. Stateless. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my mother, but about that time in 1949, 49 is when, uh, January 49 is when Mr. Truman ordered his uh, troop ships to go to China and pick these people up. He said they've had enough. They don't need to go through this again. Get them out of there. So uh, they couldn't bring the troop ships into the harbor because communists were already in Shanghai. So they sent out these little PT boats. Remember the ones that flapped the back down? And you run way deep through, deep through water, this type of stuff. Anyways, we got onto the SS Gordon, which took us to San Francisco, first to Hawaii, and a wonderful three days, four days in Hawaii. We didn't have any money. My mother had $2.50. My word. And the courage it must have taken. Now, were you mal malnutritioned at that at time? At that time, not anymore, no. By that time, <laughs> I was 16. And uh, from the end of the war, from 45 to 49, we're pretty uh, healthy years for mm -hmm. us, you know, we're getting better, we're pretty well mentally organized again, and so uh, in Hawaii when we got off, they allowed us kids to get off, and we wound up in the uh, Royal Hawaiian Hotel at the time. Oh, boy. And we'd never seen what a, a beautiful water, place. What a, we'd never seen a water fountain before like they, they oh, had, really? you know, so uh -huh. the managers evidently noticed there was a whole bunch of kids getting off the ship, ship, and they set up a table with tablecloths and, and pineapple juice out of the clear blue sky. I don't know how they ever, you know, nobody paid for this stuff. Beautiful stuff, yeah. And it was just out of their generosity, they uh, treated us like we were really something special. Yeah. Well, that was all part of the, you know, um, all part of the, uh, I want to say, um, not the Marshall Plan, but it, it it was before the Marshall Plan, <clears throat> you know, when we started to yeah. rebuild Germany and so forth. But 
but uh, there, there, I, 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 I know about that a little bit. And of course, the Navy, the Royal Hawaiian, was was taken over uh, by the Navy during the war. That's probably why, because we came off a Navy ship. Sure. And it was a troop transport. Right. But the food on that ship was phenomenal. Wow. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but at the time, at the tables, they had a little edge on the ship. So mm -hmm. when the ship shifts, sure. you don't get so the food in your lap. So when plate off. Yeah, and of course we were, we had about, I'd say maybe 20 of us were teenagers. And uh, we were sitting all in one long line there and eating, and the ship does one of these numbers, and we kept right on eating off the next person's plate. <laughs> <laughs> pass it on down. got a big kick out of this, you know, <laughs> pass it on down. The ship went that way, well, you wound up with somebody. You know, nowadays you'd say, oops, I can't eat off of this guy's plate. No. <laughs> we didn't care whose plate we ate off oh, of. Oh, I know. <laughs> but, uh, and the a beautiful Navy. swimming pool there and, and Waikiki Beach and everything. Well, we were only uh, there for a few days. Mm -hmm. And again, my mother was one, let's explore. We don't have any money to spend, but we can look around and see what it is. And sure. it was just, Hawaii was still, Oahu was still the original Oahu. You know, it wasn't like it is now. No. Now no. it's a tourist no. trap. Right. And it breaks my heart to see it that way. Oh, but I should say so. It was phenomenal, and they uh, were gracious to us. They treated us like, I say, like we were something very special. And here we were just a bunch of kids that had a rough road at one point. Well, you were, you were fortunate because, as you point out, uh, Hawaiian people are very, very hospitable yes, and very friendly. Yes, they were extremely and, hospitable. Oh, that's wonderful. Then you went from there to, to Vancouver? San Francisco, no, we went to San Francisco. San Francisco. Yeah, we came in through the Golden Gate Bridge that night. At 2.20, we passed under the Golden Gate Bridge, and there wasn't a person on that SS Gordon that wasn't on deck. How about that? And uh, I think it gave us a glimpse into a possible future. One of the very first real glimpses where you felt, well, here I can do something. Mm -hmm. That was a phenomenal feeling, absolutely phenomenal. I'm Sure, it must have been. And uh, we got off the ship. We, between Hawaii and San Francisco, they had the uh, customs people on board. They pick them up in Hawaii and then drop them off in San Francisco, you know. And my mother, we had to declare what we had. Well, my mother had $2.50. <laughs> and he says to my mother, Mrs. Isaac, I don't doubt that that's all you have. He says, but it'll go a lot easier for you if you let me add a few zeros to the end of that number. Nobody will question you having $250 versus $2.50. Mm. He says, but they will question the $2.50. Nobody has that kind of courage, you know. <laughs> but that's what we had, hey. That was it, of course. Absolutely. And uh, <laughs> so my mother says, well, if you think this is better, do so. <laughs> She spoke with a real happy accent. She hardly could, hardly could speak any English when she came to the States. But she still spoke with a heavy accent when mm -hmm. she died at 85. And, uh, Did you have any sense of, from your elders, about, <coughs> about the forming of the country of Israel? Yes, we had the option to go to Israel. Oh, you did? Yes, we could have gotten out of China probably sooner than we did, but my mother felt it was unfair to my sister and me. I because, see. first of all, we spoke only English right. and German and Chinese and Japanese. We spoke absolutely no Hebrew. And the Hebrew they taught us in school was, e was Ivrit, which is biblical Hebrew, right? Mm -hmm. And that wouldn't have done us any good over there. <laughs> Not my, very practical. No. <laughs> so my mother felt this would have been unfair. We'll take a chance. And then we also had an option to possibly go to Santo Domingo, the islands. Oh. And again, we didn't speak Spanish or Portuguese, which ah. are the two languages spoken hmm. there. So my mother was really researching the stuff as best she could for the benefit of my sister and me. Mm -hmm. My father had chipped my older brother out in 1947, once he turned 18. Well, actually he was 20 by then, but as soon as we could, he shipped them out to my uncle and aunt in New Jersey. 
because we, he could get him out of China, but we couldn't get out. Because you see, as an individual young man, he had potential, so a visa was easier to get. For a family with children, where's the potential? See, and this is the, this, those were the immigration laws. Mm -hmm. So he shipped my brother out, and he was in New Jersey, and my mother felt that uh, for possibly keeping the family together, and for the betterment for the two of us girls, let's see if we can get some way to the States. So that's how we wound up in San Francisco. And then there is an organization called HAIAS, H-A-I-S, it's an acronym for Hebrew. What they do is they take dislocated people and take them to where they, to relocate them. Mm -hmm. It's a Jewish organization, but they also handle Right now, they're doing it with uh, people in Afghanistan and all over the world. They're still active. And when we got to San Francisco, after we got through the customs and all this, there was somebody standing with a sign that said, Isaac. So uh, my mother says, why is my name, our name up there? I says, I don't know, I'll go ask. So my sister and I both spoke English, so I went over and asked. And they asked me a few pertinent questions. If they had the right Isaac, they had the right Isaacs. So they took us to a hotel in San Francisco, and we stayed there for seven days. Then they put us on a Pullman train, and we went clear across to New Jersey, where my uncle and aunt were, because they were, by that time, authorized sponsors for us. Mm -hmm. In that interim time, to get us out of there, their sponsorship came through for us. So we had to go to New Jersey. They put us on this Pullman train. And uh, as we're traveling along, my sister and I watched the roadside go by. I don't remember the old Pullman trains with the high seats in them. So Ingrid and I were talking, and one of us we were noting all the signs, the billboards. And uh, one of us says the other one, I wonder what they have lots for sale of. They all read lots for sale. I couldn't imagine what they had lots for sale off. And there was a gentleman in the booth in front of us, and he comes over and he looks at us, he says, where are you two girls from? <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea that lots were acreage, because mm -hmm. we spoke Oxford English, we didn't speak American English. So, uh, it, uh, when we got to Chicago, we had to change train stations. And here we are on the train again, the old sign of Isaac came up. This was all done by the highest people. Oh. Uh, sign of Isaac comes up and talked to the lady as she says, uh, got us all, she put us in, a, she, we all went in a cab, she went with us to the other station and got us on the next train to New Jersey. And at the train station, my uncle and aunt were waiting for us and we got oh. on. So. My word, what a joyous. Reunion. It, was, it was nice, yes. <clears throat> I figure in that interim time, the last time uh, my mother and my uncle and aunt saw each other was 11 years earlier. You know, 11 years had transpired with a horrible time in between. <laughs> but uh, immediately my uncle uh, felt that my sister, who was 17 at the time, should try and get a job and I needed to go back to school. So my uncle was uh, uh, in charge of languages for the New Jersey schools, because he spoke many, many languages. And uh, he uh, got somebody to find out wh what are they going to do with me, you know. Hmm. I went to an English school, and the schooling is so different from American schools, and this was March by then. and. So they ran me through a battery of tests, and they said I had 18 years of school, and I looked at the gentleman that was telling me this, I said, that's impossible. He says, why is it impossible? I says, I'm only 16 years old. <laughs> I had no concept that you can have more education than your age, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, anyways, they put me in with a graduating class just to see how it works in the <laughs> States, you know. The first day to school was a disaster. They handed me this combination number. I'd never seen a combination lock before. And everybody was coming out of the class, and I still hadn't figured out how to open the lock where I was supposed to hang my clothes in and put my books in. So, <laughs> but uh, 
anyways, by the time I was uh, 22, I decided I had worked for RCA hmm. for five years. Where was this? RCA in New Jersey. In New, New Jersey. Uh, actually, in Harrison, New Jersey. And uh, I supported my mother and brother. My sister at the time had gotten married, and her husband was a military man, so they were shipped out. And uh, so I supported my mother and brother. My brother was just a little kid, and hmm. my mother going to work, she couldn't earn enough money to pay for the babysitter. So uh, I went out to work, and I went to school at the same time. And uh, by the time I was 22, I decided, OK, mom is starting to learn English pretty good. She needs something more than just Freddie and me. And uh, so I wanted to do something. I felt I owed something to this country. Let's face it, how many of these young men that uh, came to open up these camps mm. gave up part of their life to get us out of there? You know, so uh, I always had that feeling that I owe this country something. So I decided I'm going to join the Air Force. <laughs> Out of the clip. Well, actually, I had messed around with the CAP unit. I joined the CAP unit in New Jersey. And they were pretty impressive. And uh, I decided, yeah, the Air Force is pretty good for me. So and I you were 18? No, I was 22 by then. 22 by then. And uh, my mother was stabilized. She had gotten a job. It's not a big paying job, but my brother was also in school. A babysitter was no longer needed. Right. In those cases, in, in those it's times, the child had a key to the front door and they let themselves in, you know. Yes. It's not like now where you couldn't leave an eight-year-old home alone. And uh, so I decided I'd join the service, and I did. I joined mm. the Air Force. They immediately shipped me out to San Antonio, Texas, which was the training base. And I believe at the time they had 2,600 women in the military. <laughs> All together. All together. And uh, they uh, tripped me out to, well, they had an instructor school over on Blackland for instructors. They decided I should be an instructor, and that's where I met my husband, in instructor school. And he taught on one side of the hall, I taught on the other side of the hall, and we'd give him a test and meet in the hall. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I enjoyed my military career very much. Uh, How long were you in? Just the three years, because actually I was on two tours. They allowed me to re-enlist for the, uh, what did they call it? re -up. For the betterment of the government, for the interest of the government. Uh, they allowed me and my husband to re-enlist early before my three years were up. Mm. But we were also the first husband and wife team. They didn't allow girls to be married at the time. Right. And he and I were the first husband and wife team on Blackland. So they allowed us to re-enlist. And uh, then, of course, eventually I wound up pregnant and out the door I went. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, my husband had orders for Germany. So. Uh, I had trepidations of going to Germany. I really did. Because it was just, you know, I didn't know how I should feel about Germany. Well, of course you. And so as a result, uh, I went over there. We really had a good time over there. We had three years over there. <laughs> and my maternal grandparents were still alive. And so I got to see them, but it took us a year and a half to get permission to go into Berlin because by then the Berlin airlift was going on. Oh, yes. And so uh, with both of us having had clearances, they uh, were very particular about how far we could go into Berlin. Hmm. So we spent three years there and came back home. My word. My but goodness. We had four children. They're all, my daughter just retired uh, two years ago, 25 years in the Air Force. Our oldest son had uh, 
15 and a half years in the Air Force before he passed away. Uh, and uh, my youngest son, he had four years in the Army, a little traitor, <laughs> four years in the Army. And our son-in-law right now is in Iraq, and so is one of my grandsons. So we have 90-some-odd years of military service from my oh, husband and me down. That's not counting my husband's <clears throat> brothers, who were all in the Second World War. But well, you certainly should be very, very proud. You, it's obvious that you have laid down uh, a, a path of life, of determination oh, yes. and honesty and straightforwardness and everything. And, uh, uh, and your children have followed that path so well. All of our children are. My youngest boy is uh, one of the big computer gurus that uh, writes books, computer books. Oh, yeah. He and his wife. And for hobby, they write sci fi books, but that's besides the point. Sci fi books. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, our next one up. The military wouldn't accept he was born with a defective heart, so they paid me because we were active duty. My husband was a 20-some-odd-year man. Oh. And uh, so they paid for all his medical expenses from birth until he was 22 years old, you know, so they wouldn't take him into the service. Sure. How did you get to Cincinnati? I was uh, civil service at Wordsmith Air Force Base in Michigan. And when Wordsmith closed down, they transferred me to the Army Corps of Engineers right down here in the mm -hmm. federal building. That's how we got mm -hmm. down here. So it's been a good, actually overall, I can say I've had the best of all lives. I saw the worst of it, and I can honestly say I've right. seen the best of it. Oh my so, you goodness. Know, it's a spectrum that uh, covers both sides. And when you've seen the worst, then you can set everything in a relative order. I'm a person I need order. And to me, by putting everything in its proper place, and I can live with it. I don't have a problem with it. Well, as you say, you've seen the, the worst and the best. And um, um, it's just, it, it, it is a most remarkable story. We are just truly, truly honored to hear your story. And to have you become an American citizen and, oh, that happened and in serve <laughs> proudly. That happened in 1954, and that was my jumping off point. I had to be a citizen to join the Air Force. Oh, yeah. And it was a jumping off point from there to join the service. In November, I made my citizenship. By January, by December 31st, I was in the service. So. <laughs> you didn't waste much time. No. <laughs> So, now, what, uh, what, what, was your, what was your activity in the Air Force? I was an instructor, and I taught mostly military law and mathematics. Really? Well, you know, the pilots, they need to be able to add one and one and come up with two, and some of them I couldn't. Know. <laughs> I know, some of them can't. <laughs> but uh, I started telling you about that necklace that my grandmother put oh, in yes. my hand. Now, the story comes back to two years ago. My uncle passed away, my aunt had passed away five years earlier. So my uncle had asked me to be the executrix of his estate. State. So here I am in my uncle and aunt's home, all by my lonesome. And uh, I had, over the years, my uncle had asked me to take care of my aunt's clothing, get them to Salvation Army or somewhere where they can be used instead of just hanging there and deteriorating. So I did this, but he never asked me to touch her dresser. She had one of those vanity dressers, but now I had to do it. I had to empty out her jewelry box, and it was a hard thing to do. So I just emptied everything out of this jewelry box like that. And there on the side is a little chain sticking out, something like that, a safety mm -hmm. chain. I went and pulled on it, and pulled it out, and there was an identical necklace to the one my grandmother had given me. 60 my years goodness. earlier, 70 years earlier. My goodness. And evidently, she must have given my aunt one, too. Isn't that so? It was almost like my grandmother was standing there saying, see, you can quit fussing yeah. about it now. Isn't that <laughs> <laughs> and among my other things that I found in my uncle's papers was uh, a letter I had written 
to my uncle and aunt. They were in California already. They were a professional couple. And she was a seamstress and he was an artist, so they got out of China sooner than we could have. Again, mm -hmm. it was all based on size of family and what your potential was. And uh, I'd written the letter to my uncle and aunt telling them that my father was gone. My father was dead. And my uncle still had that letter too. <laughs> so I have all of this in a frame at home. You yeah, have all. Uh, passenger list and the letter, the card to my other aunt and uncle in New Jersey and that letter. It's kind of kind of phenomenal to find these things here. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it is indeed, and it's it's so important <clears throat> for your entire family because right. they'll have things passed down to them. Absolutely, that's and, why I'm uh, trying to keep them all. They'll know what it's all about. Yeah. Well, Lisa, this has been a truly a great great experience right. to hear you. your story, thank and you. we thank you so much for what you've done, what you suffered through. Uh, and your devotion to the United States of America now and all that good thing. So we wish you, you well. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you. Much. And uh, you'll, you'll be amazing. getting a DVD on this. You're an amazing gentleman to do this.